Hey everybody, my name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. I'm gonna stall here a little bit while the participant numbers uh, rapidly fire up. We have a giant crowd today. Uh, Happy New Year, first of all. Uh, welcome back to the FSI seminar series. Uh, as you may recall, at the end of last year, we were planning to take a break. Uh, we had had the COVID pandemic and a series about that. We had had Black Lives Matters protests and a series about that. And I think we were all thinking we've had enough Zoom calls, enough seminars. Uh, let's go back to regular order. And for those of you who are new to FSI, regular order for us means that the centers, the individual centers all run their own seminar series programs. Uh, and all those are ongoing. They've all started fantastic lineups. I urge you to go visit our website uh, and see what is happening at the various centers. But after uh, last week's horrible, ter horrific, uh, I could add a lot of other adjectives, but I'm gonna let our panelists do that, events um, in uh, Washington and the assault on our democracy, both from the White House and within the Congress and outside of the Congress into the Capitol building, uh, we decided that we had to revisit and resurrect the uh, FSI seminar series, and that's what we're starting with today. Uh, this one is called uh, January 6th and the Crisis of American Democracy. Uh, we have an all-star uh, lineup today, and I'll hand it over to Frank in a moment to introduce everybody. We will continue this series, at least for a while, uh, given that there are so many different dimensions um, at play here. Next week, January 22nd, uh, the Cyber Policy Center, one of the other centers here at FSI, uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll hand the baton over to them and they will focus on issues of free speech and internet regulation. And the third meeting in this series uh, will pivot to more global issues, international issues, and the implications of events here in the United States recently for the Biden administration's pledge to devote greater attention <clears throat> and energy to defending democracy and human rights abroad. So stay tuned uh, for further information for all of those events uh, uh, in the future. Uh, we will post recordings of all of these sessions, including this one, at our website at fsi.stanford.edu. So if you want to send that around to those that couldn't join us today, uh, please do so. As I said, we have a fantastic uh, lineup today. Uh, the center hosting this event is the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. Uh, the director of that center is Professor Frank Fukuyama. Uh, he's the Mossbacher Director of CDDRL. In addition, he is also the uh, Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And he's also the director of the Ford Dorsey uh, uh, Masters in International Policy Program based here at FSI. Frank, I can't believe you do all these things and still write and publish and comment. Um, uh, and I hope Frank will be a very active moderator in today's session because he has a lot to say about these issues. I highly recommend his last book called Identity. Um, um, and I highly recommend just uh, months ago before these events, uh, his essay, I think it was his inaugural essay in his brand new journal called The American Purpose, uh, the title of which was Liberalism and Its Discontents, The Challenges from the Left and the Right. Uh, could not be more appropriate for this conversation. Um, but Frank, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce the rest of our panel and thank you all for being here today. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, uh, be able to help organize this panel. Uh, you know, at the Center for Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, we were heavily focused on international democracy, but we realized, you know, almost 10 years ago that American democracy was becoming incredibly problematic and the United States could not hope to be a beacon of democracy and good democratic practice to the rest of the world uh, if we didn't clean up our own act. And so we've increasingly been uh, turning uh, to thinking about American democracy and institutions. And so it's very appropriate to have this session. So uh, I think that all of us have a sense that last Wednesday, we witnessed a really big event uh, in American history that's going to be remembered for a very long time. The first time since the War of 1812 that the American capital was uh, attacked and breached. Uh, but I must say that 
predicting how American democracy is going to evolve from this point forward, to me is more uncertain than it's ever been because you can imagine uh, some very positive scenarios under a new Biden administration and you can imagine some really uh, terrible ones in which the United States will descend into a kind of violence and, and discord that you know we witness a lot in other countries, but we really haven't seen very much since the American uh, Civil War. So these are the kinds of issues we want to discuss. We've got an all-star uh, cast speaking. Um, our first speaker will be Pamela Carlin, she's a professor uh, in the uh, Stanford Law School, co-director uh, of SLS's Supreme Court Litigation uh, Clinic. She's a commissioner in the California uh, uh, Fair Political Practices Commission, and she was deputy assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division of the US Department of Justice. She's a leading um, expert on constitutional law, and you may remember her from her testimony the first time Donald Trump was uh, impeached when she spoke to Congress uh, back then. Uh, the second panelist will be Bill Crystal. Uh, Bill has been a friend of mine ever since I inherited his apartment back in Cambridge when we were both graduate students uh, in the Gov Department um, at Harvard. Uh, he worked uh, as chief of staffs to both um, William Bennett and uh, Vice President Dan Quayle uh, in former administrations. Uh, he has, <clears throat> uh, uh, he was the founder of a magazine called The Weekly Standard, which unfortunately was shut down, what was it now, three years ago, but he has moved on to create The Bulwark, help create The Bulwark, which I regard as the leading voice of never Trump uh, uh, Republicans uh, and has done a spectacular job in articulating, uh, you know, exactly what the, uh, uh, what the challenge to democracy posed by this administration has been. Uh, David Kennedy is uh, Donald McLaughlin Professor of History Emeritus, an extremely uh, distinguished uh, historian. He was the former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Uh, his many books have won many prizes, beginning with his first book on Margaret Sanger that won the Bancroft Prize, and then a 2000 uh, Pulitzer Prize for his book um, freedom from fear, the American people in depression uh, and war. And finally, I don't have to um, introduce to this audience our own Larry Diamond, senior fellow uh, at both FSI and the Hoover Institution. I would say that Larry is probably the world's leading expert on global democracy. His most recent book uh, was Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American complacency. And I think now you're gonna to have to retitle that American complicity. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, let's begin. So Pam, why don't you start us off and maybe say a few things about the impeachment and you know, your other observations from uh, January 6th. Sure, so thanks so much for having me. I was asked to talk about the impeachment and the legal constitutional issues that are surrounding the insurrection. I'll make one observation at the beginning that we can return to in the questions uh, if that's useful for people. And that is on top of everything else, the Capitol as several of the representatives said during the impeachment uh, discussion uh, earlier this week was a regular crime scene. And there are a number of regular crimes that can be charged and are already being charged against uh, individuals involved in the planning or in the actual attack these range from conspiracy charges to trespass charges to interference with government operations. Uh, obviously, some people are going to be charged with assault. Uh, I would expect that the people involved in the beating and the subsequent death uh, of the police officer, at the very least, will be charged with some form of felony murder. And then on top of that, there's a federal criminal statute that deals with rebellion or insurrection. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, there have been dozens of, of people already charged, but I would expect a lot more. Um, what I want to focus on, though, is talking about uh, uh, the presidency, the impeachment, uh, and then uh, the potential uh, blowback on members of Congress as well. So let me start with what the president can be impeached for. 
Uh, Article two, section four of the constitution essentially says that the president uh, and all civil officers of the United States can be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And one of the things that I testified about uh, during the last impeachment, a, a phrase I never thought I would say, is that when the Constitution talks about crime, high crimes and misdemeanors, it's not just referring to things in the criminal code like robbery or assault or murder or the like. Uh, abuse of power was thought of by the framers of the Constitution as a central aspect of the, high, of the idea of high crimes and misdemeanors. At the Constitutional Convention, for example, William Davey, who was one of the delegates, warned that unless the Constitution had an impeachment provision, a president might, in his words, spare no efforts or means whatsoever to get himself reelected. And George Mason, who's the person who added the phrase high crimes or misdemeanors to the constitutional text, said that one of the reasons we needed an impeachment was that a president who, in his words, procured his appointment in the first instance through improper and corrupt acts should not escape punishment by repeating his guilt. So we know that the list of high crimes and misdemeanors was designed to reach a president who acts to subvert an election. And here, the impeachment uh, article that the House voted out earlier this week was for incitement of insurrection. And it was an insurrection designed to keep the president in office. Um, now, it may not be, uh, and this is, this is a really tough question, that this incitement would be incitement in the sense of ordinary criminal law, but at least in the sense of high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, the president's actions here, where he encouraged fighting the election and encouraged uh, his supporters to go down and fight like hell uh, at the Capitol, uh, is the kind of thing that would fall within the idea of a high crime or misdemeanor. Um, the other interesting thing to note is how Congress pared down uh, its article of impeachment here so that it focuses on the attack on the Capitol and uses all of the efforts that the president led up until that point to undercut the results of the 2020 election simply as kind of a backdrop to the incitement of the insurrection uh, on January 6th. Let me turn now to some of the interesting secondary questions that I think this impeachment raises. Um, so I've already described to you how Article 2 talks about the high crimes and misdemeanors. Let me turn now to Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution. It says that judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or proof uh, under the United States. And so there are two penalties potentially for an impeachment. The first is you get removed from office. And the second is that you get disqualified from ever holding office again. Uh, not every impeachment results in that second penalty as well. Uh, but that second penalty is part of the reason why um, most scholars uh, and the members of Congress mostly think that the impeachment process can continue after the president leaves office. That is, uh, as of January 20th, the Constitution automatically removes him from office. His term ends at noon. Uh, but the question whether he can ever run for president again still needs to be determined. And so Congress, uh, the Senate may end up holding the trial in order to convict him and make that decision. That is the decision uh, that he can no longer uh, run for office uh, in the future. And one of the arguments why that uh, ability to continue the process even after someone has left office is critical is if you didn't have the ability to continue the impeachment process, then anyone who's being impeached could avoid the disqualification by simply resigning two seconds before he got impeached. Uh, and the Secretary of War who was impeached uh, many, uh, many, many decades ago uh, did uh, resign immediately before the impeachment. Let me turn now to an, a couple of other aspects of the Constitution that are at issue here. And the one that you may have seen a lot of discussion of recently is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that no person can be a senator or a representative or hold any office under the United States or under any state, which essentially means you can't be a government official if having previously taken an oath to support the Constitution. 
which every government official down to the lowest one has done, that person shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion. And this is a really interesting part of the constitution. It was put in uh, after the civil war to deal with uh, uh, people who had been uh, either government officials prior to the civil war or military officers and who aided the Confederacy. And the question here is, uh, how does this provision operate? That is, the provision simply says you can't hold an office if you've done one of these things, but it doesn't say who decides that, uh, how and when. Um, so one of the unanswered questions here is, does this even cover inciting an insurrection rather than actually being engaged into the, in the insurrection? And how is it enforced? And you may have seen some discussions uh, and we're likely to see more about whether this provision uh, applies to President Trump himself, and whether it applies to any of the other government officials who were involved, uh, stretching from members of Congress who might arguably have been uh, uh, argued to have incited the insurrection here, down to uh, local police officers who showed up uh, as part of the uh, invading and uh, invading mob. Finally, I'll just mention that in addition to these parts of the Constitution themselves, there's also uh, the possibility that Congress will, um, uh, will uh, pass censure resolutions uh, either against its own members or, for example, Speaker McCarthy has suggested against the president. And the last thing that we're seeing quite a bit of, which is civil society sanctions, that is uh, the Constitution with a small c and the way in which that Constitution uh, responds uh, to the insurrection of uh, 2020. So that's my, you told me seven to 10 minutes and I yep. came in at eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, you'll get another chance because there's already a lot of uh, questions about legal issues that are brought up by, uh, by these events. All right, so um, now we'll turn to Bill, the Republican Party. Uh, you've seen the first big breaks uh, in the solidarity behind President Trump, uh, but it does seem to me that the future of the country depends a lot on what happens uh, within that party and which side of that new division uh, wins out. So Bill, uh, please go ahead. Thanks Frank, and it's good to be with you all and with all of you uh, watching, um, though it's a, a sad occasion, honestly, that, that prompted this sort of uh, urgent gathering uh, that what happened on January 6th. I mean, it really was a crisis of American democracy, like a lot of crises, it had been building for quite a while, and it was in a way the, the visible manifestation of things that had already been well underway, but sometimes that's what you need to, to get the kind of reaction that you should get. Sometimes you don't get the reaction uh, you should get, and I, I'm very much with Frank in thinking that the uncertainty about where we go from now is, is really just, it is real, and, and it's a very fluid and unpredictable situation, both for better and worse. I, a European ambassador, I happen to talked to you yesterday, he used to have me to lunch every once a year or so at his nice, you know, this is Mike McFall, is very familiar with this, of course, his, fa his fancy residence and in Calarama, and uh, and uh, it was always a nice occasion, a very friendly pro-American ambassador uh, from, from an allied country, and of course now it's kind of a pathetic, you know, one hour Zoom meeting, so, you know, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's good to talk to him, and he said, he said he had sent his weekly uh, a cable, I guess it's, they still call it a cable. It's not literally a cable anymore, I guess, back to uh, to the home foreign office. Uh, and he'd said he had titled it one six, you know, one slash six, because he thought one six could become as significant as nine eleven. It could become a term that we all use. And did I agree with that? And I said, I, I thought it was possible. And in a way, I thought it might be a good thing if that happened, because it would be such a, it would be a wake up call. When I said wake up call, he interrupted me and said, yes, I even, I've studied some American history. He's proud of being, you know, kind of knowledgeable about American things. And he said, and I called it a fire bell in the night, which Jefferson used uh, in 1820, I believe, for the fight leading up to the Missouri Compromise. I didn't have the heart to tell him that that was a great line of Jefferson's and, and the Missouri Compromise was probably a good thing as far as it went, but it didn't actually deal with the problem of slavery and it's kicked the can down the road, now kicked down the road a few decades, so that's not nothing. But in the end of the day, uh, we didn't deal with that firebell in the night and we didn't deal with it very well after the Civil War either, or the firebell in the night it wasn't a wake up call as it should have been, you might say. And I worry that that might be the case uh, this time too. So I think we, it's it'd be foolish to, I mean, we need to think hard about the implications and of what happened and, and to uh, draw the right draw lessons from it and, and a sense of urgency from it. But that you know, doesn't always happen that you, you do what you should do. 
So um, let me say, on the Republican Party, I'll just say a word about that, and then very, very quickly, a couple of words about the, the broader situation. I'm mildly pessimistic about the, and I'm pessimistic about the Republican Party. I'll strike mildly in the sense that uh, maybe I'm too close to it. You know, I saw what happened in 2015, 2016, opposed Trump, didn't think he'd win the primaries. He won them, didn't think he'd win the general election. He won that, assumed that Republicans would keep Trump in check to some degree. They didn't. Uh, fought hard for various, well, hard, but fought for various rule of law efforts to constrain him on emergency powers and all that in 2018, 2019. We have Republicans for the rule of law that mostly failed. Tried to get Republicans to support impeachment that failed entirely, except for Mitt Romney in the Senate for conviction. Tried to get Republicans to challenge Trump uh, in the primary, uh, which is not which has happened before. It's not that uncommon, uncommon to have primary challenges in either party, uh, especially for a president who's something of an outlier, that we got a couple of people who, to their credit, stepped up, but it wasn't, they weren't serious or credible candidates, and, and they weren't because the party was behind Trump. And then in the general election, Trump, then we had Republican voters against Trump, we being this divided democracy uh, together group that I'm involved in. We, we started Republican voters against Trump. We did a lot of work and raised a lot of money. And I maybe pried a couple of percent of Republican voters away from Trump who might not otherwise have deserted. And it might have made the difference in Wisconsin and Arizona and Pennsylvania. So I'm glad we did it. But it, even so, you know, 90% probably of 91% of Republicans stuck with Trump. And of course, Republicans paid no price down ballot for being with Trump on November 3rd. Maybe they did on January 5th in Georgia, but you know they increased their House seats. They uh, held, they lost one seat in the Senate. They held state legislative chambers. They're in good shape for reapportionment. As a political science matter, you'd have to predict they'd probably win the House in 2022, have a reasonable shot in 2024 and a kind of post-Trump election and don't really have to repudiate Trump until maybe the last three months, two and a half months. So that's sort of a November, th November 4th, I think, a depressing snapshot. Maybe Trump's behavior over these last two months will change things. I mean, one would have thought his behavior over preceding months and years might have, but you know, you never know what is the sort of tipping point. Um, and and the behavior before the election, then then immediately after the election, then the intensification instead of the pulling back after the different inflection points when it, you know, when various authorities did uh, ratify Biden's victory and some Republicans at the state and local level acted, you know, in a, in a decent and honorable way to, to make sure that the votes were counted accurately and that they weren't overturning popular will. But then on December 6th to see what happened in the Capitol and then have half the Republican members of Congress, basically about 65% of the House members, only a small number actually of the senators, but if you just added up, it's probably the easiest thing to do, try to capture the you know, X-ray into where the Republican party is. Half the Republican party is sufficiently attached to Trump, and I would say to Trumpism, that it was willing to just flat out vote to throw out the votes of electors. And that was sort of, they knew it wasn't gonna work and maybe it's a easy way to pacify your base. So maybe it doesn't quite show where the party really, really is. On the other hand, it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's not like that happens every time, right? I mean, it's not like we have a lot, a lot of history of people you know, throwing out the votes of electors from states. We've had a tiny history of token protests by one Senator and Congressman in 2005 and you know an occasional stray, uh, uh, what's it, what are they called? Unfaithful elector, but nothing like this. I mean, literally nothing like this since 1876, when which was such a fiasco that they passed legislate that it was that they passed legislation to prevent it from happening again in 1887. So the cavalier, the extent to which we've sort of moved on from what happened on the evening of January 6th, has has me somewhat alarmed. I mean, I'm not saying we've moved on, but I feel like the political class, in a way, isn't sufficiently coming to grips with what happened. It's not just about Trump's incitement and Trump's negligence uh, that day, which is very important. Uh, and impeachment is good in my opinion, but it's about what the Republicans in Congress uh, did, said and did. You know, and if you think of that as maybe the X-ray and then if you put it together with the impeachment vote, so basically half the Republicans are with Trump no matter what. 10% of the Republicans, a little less, and the 5% in the House, probably be more in the Senate are willing to even say he should be impeached, but let's just call that 10% for rounding purposes. Uh, and then the other 40% didn't want to overturn the electors, but didn't want to impeach Trump. And I, I think that's actually not a bad x-ray of the Republican Party in its elected officials at the federal level, probably at the state level, and probably of the voters. That is, it's 10% anti-Trump, 50% uh, basically pro-Trump, and 40% sort of 
okay with Trump, willing to tolerate Trump, willing to rationalize Trump uh, when useful, but a little bit worried and put off and not willing to go the, the final mile in Trump and Trumpism. That could get better when Trump will be out of office. You know, I think he will be less powerful. He'll have, he won't have very first one, he won't have the White House and so forth. Might look a little more like a, you know, has been in Mar-a-Lago, you know, raging against the winds instead of a powerful president. Even if it gets a little better though, it's not gonna get, it's not gonna be totally transformed. So I'd say short, medium term, I'm fairly pessimistic about having a Republican party that is solidly, and it sounds crazy to say this, but I mean, solidly pro-democracy, solidly anti-authoritarian, really willing to repudiate demagoguery. I think we'll have a Republican party that will not engage in it as much as it did when Trump was president, that maybe could go for weeks or months looking like a regular party. But the moment a demagogue emerges at the state level or at the federal level and seems to be catching on, find some issue to whip up hatreds or anxieties or resentments over, do we have confidence that the party wouldn't collapse more or less as it has with Trump, with the caveat that Trump's a little unusual and maybe distinctive, do we have confidence that that wouldn't happen again? And I don't. So I'm pe somewhat pessimistic about the Republican Party, which is kind of a big deal because we have two parties in this country. We have had a uh, two-party system. It's, if both your parties are basically committed to the to liberal democracy and to the constitutional order, that helps you a lot. If one of your parties is committed and the other one is not really very committed and even not and kind of even willing to go pretty far in, you know, in, in overturning it or tolerating efforts to overturn it or excusing demagogues who seek to overturn it. That's not a great thing. I mean, it's a way step way, way beyond Joe McCarthy or George Wallace or Huey Long or whatever examples you want of senators or governors who had some sway in some areas, unfortunate, for two, three, five years and did some damage to the country. But that's different from the, 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 the degree to which the party as a whole now is not a solid force for our democracy. And it's a two-party system, so that's a very big deal. Very, very quickly. And, and finally, um, I am encouraged, on the other hand, by some of the other things that are happening. And other people in this call know, will, will talk, uh, know much more about them. I think on the democracy reform, broadly speaking, uh, I think that's been energized over the last year or two or three, and, and maybe by January 6th, in the sense that we could get a bunch of electoral reforms, ethics reforms, presidential power reforms of the kind that Jack Goldsmith and Bob Bauer suggest in their book. I think that's more likely than it would have been. And, that, and those are reforms, again, that have, probably should have been done earlier, congressional reforms. Some of that, I think, is, is hopeful. Um, I think what Pam mentioned just in passing on corporations and maybe donors, uh, not simply going along with everything, civil society, so to speak, acting to informally impose constitutional limits or strengthen the uh, the underlying constitution. That's very hopeful, I think, and that's something that really could make a difference and is important, I think, going ahead. The corporate donor efforts to not support those who are actually against uh, ratifying the will of the voters. And finally, on social media, which I know Frank and I think others of you uh, have done a huge amount of thinking about and work on. I mean, there, I personally have become much more uh, alarmed and energized on that. I mean, and I think there, there's a chance maybe for, for both action by the companies, but also legislation and, and voluntary action and the mixture of government and private efforts to really take that seriously. Because it really is, uh, it turns out that I think my colleague Jonathan Last wrote a good piece about this a couple of days ago in the Bulwark that if you, uh, was it the Constitution is not a suicide pact? What was that, Justice Jackson, I think? Um, but, you know, social media can't be, it shouldn't be a social suicide pact either. And there's got to be a middle ground between uh, anarchy and the state of nature on the one hand and, you know, what we don't want, which is, you know, China kind of regulation and, and heavy handed government censorship, obviously. But I think. The chant now whether we could actually get there with some combination of legislation and voluntary action by companies and citizens, I don't know. But I feel that that, again, the chances of people being serious about that now are greater than they were a couple of years ago. So I'm sort of optimistic on these other fronts, but worried about dealing with the Republican Party for the foreseeable future that is not a reliable uh, defender of liberal democracy. Okay, thank you, Bill. So at this historical moment, we turn to a great historian. I think also, I would not be surprised if you got a question about Josh Hawley, since he, David, uh, as I understand, was your student when he was uh, an undergraduate here 
at Stanford, but uh, please, your reflections on this particular moment. Well, I'm going to uh, enter into competition with uh, Bill Crystal about who has a more pessimistic view. Um, <laughs> and I want to talk about a few things that <clears throat> historians are usually uncomfortable talking about because traditionally they're difficult to really make concrete and empirically responsible and quantify. And I'm talking about popular sentiment and psychology. Um, and I want to call attention particularly to, uh, Bill, I think in the same passage, I think it's the same passage where Jefferson said uh, it was like a fire bell in the night. <clears throat> I think that's also where he said, we have the wolf by the ears and we dare not let him go. The wolf in that case was slavery. The wolf here that I want to talk about to torture the metaphor uh, is not slavery, but uh, the very important but elusive matter of trust. And though, as I say, historians are usually shy about talking about things that are so difficult to measure accurately. It turns out we do have some very reliable polling data about trust and confidence. Our uh, citizens are trust in our major institutions and not uh, less, uh, any lesser importance, our trust in one another. We have good data going back at least to the 1970s and in some cases back to the 1950s. <clears throat> and with the single exception of the military, which is the only major institution that commands more trust today than it did a generation or two ago. And every other institution of any consequence in our society, we trust it less, we have less confidence in it. Uh, confidence in the Congress is down into the single digit range. Confidence in the presidency up until very recently at least was in the 10 to 15% range. Confidence in the court system, still minority, it's about 30%. That's doing a little better than the other major institutions, but. Still only about 30% of us have much confidence in the courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and our confidence in the news media of all stripes is down again in the pretty close to the single digit range. Now that's disturbing enough, uh, but the to me the still more disturbing element in this <clears throat> is that not only have we as a people lost confidence in our major institutions, institutions of governance salient amongst those, but others as well, the churches, the Boy Scouts, the YMCA, I mean, you name it, we just have less confidence than we did. But we've also become more mistrustful of one another, just individual to individual, person to person. So I'll give you some quick data about that. In March, 2020, according to a Pew poll, just about 50% of all Americans thought that their fellow citizens could not be trusted. And the only reason that wasn't over 50% is because older people, people over 65 essentially, had a bit more trust in their fellow citizens than younger people. And you could go down the scale, parse these data on all kinds of ways. Yet the younger you are, the more mistrustful you are. If you're in a minority community, you're likely to be more mistrustful. If you're on the lower end of the income scale, you're likely to be more mistrustful. If you have less education than your fellow citizens, you're more mistrustful. So as a people, we've become very wary of one another and lost confidence in our institutions. This is a terrible uh, element in our body politic, a sickness in our body politic. Seems to be one of the, it's a cliche, I suppose, but the, the goal of socialization in this or any society is somehow to induce people to do voluntarily what they really have to do if the society is to proceed in a peaceful fashion. So we all have to internalize norms about obeying rules and so on. Fundamental to a lot of that is confidence in fair play, in the equitability of institutions, and the reliability of each other to one another. So we've lost a lot of that. On the eve of the election, again, I'll give you a little more data about this. On the eve of the election, uh, there was a YouGov poll, a pretty reliable polling organization. And so this goes back about, what, three months ago or so. <coughs> 52% of registered voters thought that it was probable that the Trump campaign would cheat. And 39% of registered voters thought it was probable that the Biden campaign would cheat. Those are enormous numbers. And that's what, that's what underlies the exploitability of this issue that Trump has made so much of in the last several months. There was fertile ground on which that message to fall because people were already predisposed to believe that the election was rigged even before he started trumpeting this as uh, flagrantly uh, as he did. So I think we're in a pretty terrible situation. We have this metaphorical wolf by the ears, and God knows how we're ever going to be able to let it go. 
Uh, I'll, uh, Frank, I heard what you said about Josh Hawley. Uh, you might understand I've been absolutely inundated with media inquiries and other inquiries about Josh. Yes, he was my student, and I do have views about him, and maybe we'll come back to it, but I just soon pass over that for the moment, but <laughs> happy to talk about it later. But let me say one thing about the events of last week at the Capitol and try to put what I, my reflection about that in the context of this deep corrosion of trust and confidence that has permeated our society in the last two generations. Um, people have called the events of last week a coup or it was common in the media to see it referred to as political drama, or pardon me, political theater. And my reaction to that is that to call it political theater is to insult the two and a half millennia old tradition in the Western world of the drama. Back to Euripides and Sophocles and Aristophanes. It's not, that wasn't theater. If, if we're gonna talk about it in that vein at all, it seems to me it was vaudeville or maybe burlesque. Um, if you think of, Larry, you might have something to say about this. You think of other coups that have happened in the world in recent times, like in Cuba in 1959 or Chile in 1973, or even in Russia in 1991, though that one failed, they had certain elements to them that were just conspicuously absent from what happened last week. Uh, the coup attempters or, or uh, the, the coup artists, or whatever we're going to call them, uh, control the media, shut down alternative media, uh, control the military. Um, they, they had a plan. They had leadership that they could look to when finally they got the platform. Those elements, it seems to me, are just conspicuously absent of what happened last week. And that was just a riot by an undisciplined mob with no real agenda or platform or real realistic hope of accomplishing anything material. Uh, the building was clear within six hours. The Congress came back and did its business before sunrise the next morning. Some coup. I mean, if this was a coup, it was a pathetic imitation of some real life coups that we've seen in our own uh, lifetime. So I'm tempted to misquote Karl Marx, who once said that history repeats itself as farce. Seems to me in this case, history started out as farce. <laughs> the, the terrible as some of the consequences were, I'm not, I don't wanna make light of that at all. I understand people died and it was a god awful violation of our most sacred political space. I'm not downplaying that at all. But I'm just saying that the people who were in that building, to the best of my ability to see at least, had no real actionable platform accessible leadership, access to the tools of governance and domination that are typical in successful or even near successful coup. And it was just an anarchic event that should, that should deeply disturb us to be sure. But what it tells me is that what it most manifests is again, this pervasive lack of confidence and trust rather than the uh, cogent articulation of an alternative way of doing business. So, I will uh, leave you with one last statistic. Again, a YouGov poll from, I believe, a week ago to today, the day after the events in the Capitol. Um, YouGov polled Republicans and Democrats about what they thought of the events of the preceding day. Bill, get ready. I'm glad you're sitting down, Bill. 45% of Republicans polled approved of the what had happened in the Capitol last Wednesday. 96% of Democrats opposed. But that 45% of Republicans okay with what happened um, is a really depressing observation, it seems to me. So, Bill, I don't know if I've topped you in pessimism, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, actually, I think the incompetence and lack of planning in the mob uh, extended to the president himself because he clearly wanted to stimulate something that would block Biden's um, uh, inauguration, but he had no idea how this was actually going to come out. And so, you know, that may be one thing we can be somewhat thankful for, that he has been incompetent through so much of his presidency and unable to accomplish, you know, these authoritarian things that he clearly intended. Um, I agree with that. I think maybe the best adjective to apply to it is pathetic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Larry, um, why don't you wrap things up for us. Uh, I'm gonna resist the temptation to comment uh, directly on what happened and what I think it means for American democracy, other than to say, I, I think it's uh, 
you know, maybe the most sobering challenge we've faced uh, in over a century. Um, I'm going to take up the task uh, Frank asked me to and talk about global reactions. I'm going to wind up, I think, being a little more hopeful, perhaps, than uh, some of my colleagues. Let me begin by saying the world is very shaken and struck and seized with this drama and the sense uh, it conveys of American democracy. And I want to underscore the following term that is so dear to Frank, state capacity in crisis and chaos. Keep in mind this comes um, after years of deepening polarization in the United States, which the world has been following closely. And um, after the, you know, also pathetic and tragic spectacle of the complete inability of the United States government to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. And with the United States having become the epicenter of it, uh, and at least in officially recorded statistics, having, you know, one of the top 10 uh, death rates in the world. Uh, the following have been the range of reactions from uh, at least other governments, and to some extent, I think we can say societies. Hostility, resentment, and vindication by our adversaries. Uh, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei used the episode to uh, denounce American democracy as a fiasco and said, today the US and American values are ridiculed even by their friends. And actually there is a bit of truth uh, to that assertion. Uh, the anti-American far left uh, French leader, Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, portrayed it as a reaction against US, uh, the United States government organizing coups and rigging elections abroad. Basically schadenfreude, you got what was coming to you. Uh, you reap what you sow. There's been a lot of authoritarian and populist solidarity. And by the way, bear in mind how many governments around the world, in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, passionately wanted Trump to be reelected. Uh, and the strange list is um, uh, Lopez Obrador, the president of our neighbor to the south in Mexico, who even though he's coming from the left has been an avid friend of Trump in the weirdest association globally I can imagine, and said, you know, again, with a, a little bit of deliberate obliqueness, we hope there will be peace that democracy, note these words now, which is the people's power, will prevail. And so, you know, a nod to populist action. There's been a lot of propagandistic exploitation of this by our adversaries. A uh, Chinese leader saying, well, this shows the greatest threat to the US is itself. And again, can we actually dispute that now in the wake of uh, January 6th? The most interesting reaction was a meme that got traction on Chinese social media which um, showed the storming of the Capitol and described it as a beautiful sight alongside a picture of the storming of the Hong Kong legislature by radical protesters in Hong Kong last year and attributing a quote to Nancy Pelosi saying that was a beautiful sight when in fact her remarks about a beautiful sight had been made in response to the peaceful protests of hundreds of thousands of people peacefully demonstrating in the streets of Hong Kong. Mike, this is for you. Um, the uh, head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Russia's Federation Council said, the celebration of democracy is over. America no longer forges that path and consequently has lost its right to define it, much less force it on others. There's been ridicule and sarcasm. The Turkish government took a statement uh, that the US government made of concern and alarm after the 2016 military coup in Turkey and just literally translated it into Turkish and released it as their statement about the American um, uh, crisis now. And a lot of Latin Americans essentially saying, who's a banana republic now? Uh, but the thing I want to emphasize for just a minute or two in conclusion is there's been a lot of not only fear, hope, and sadness 
among our democratic allies, but solidarity as well. And I think this represents the very acute sense among our, our democratic allies and among a wide range of Democrats around the world. I spent a lot of time talking to journalists uh, in the past week from major newspapers in Germany, Britain, Brazil, Japan, Korea, and so on. And there's no schadenfreude there. There's a sense that, of being shaken and hopeful because they know how important the United States is to the global democratic uh, cause. Uh, French President Macron issued uh, a video uh, where he spoke in front of the French, uh, US and EU flags, expressing solidarity and faith in the resilience of American democracy. Germany, which if you've been reading the New York Times articles about radical extremist penetration of the police and security units, and which had a QAnon ill-fated attempt to storm the Reichstag in August, uh, is very seized with this. Angela Merkel said she was furious and also sad, Lamed the, laid the blame, as I think most of us do, squarely at the feet of President Trump and said, I greatly regret that President Trump did not hit, concede his defeat in November or yesterday and said what many of us think, that he created the atmosphere for this. I want to close uh, with the comments of um, a German media commentator for Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, who's uh, Daniel Brosler, who wrote, I think these are very important words. Germany's democracy owes its existence to the United States. Now it, meaning Germany, owes them solidarity, no less than after the attacks of 9-11, including for its own sake, that is Germany's sake. The notion that German democracy could survive without its American counterpart is absurd. So I think we've got a lot of capital still to draw on uh, in terms of uh, renewing democratic purpose and solidarity, but it's gonna have to come with a very strong dose of humility and in particular transatlantic cooperation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of questions. Um, Let's begin, there's a whole bunch of legal questions, which I think are mostly directed at, uh, at Pam. Uh, so one of them is, are there other alternatives for holding uh, President Trump accountable other than impeachment uh, once he's gone, like charging him with uh, various kinds of uh, federal crimes? And a related question, uh, is there, are there legal ways of holding members of Congress that appear to have abetted the, uh, the riot uh, accountable. Why don't we start there? Sure, so I'll start with the second question and then work back to the first, which is um, if it were shown that a member of Congress aided and abetted the insurrection, I mean, you're seeing reports about uh, some of the insurrectionists claiming they had worked with members of Congress. There have been charges which haven't been um, uh, verified or not yet that some of the members of Congress took some of the insurrectionists on tours the day before or the like, then yes, they could be held criminally liable. Uh, they could also be expelled from Congress by a two thirds vote. And then there's the question whether they would qualify under uh, section three of the 14th amendment as people ineligible to hold office under the United States. Uh, so those are methods. Uh, with regard to the president, um, basically the same holds true. If it were shown that he violated a criminal law, he could be held criminally liable. Uh, the best understanding is that a president can't be charged with a federal criminal offense while he's in office, uh, but he doesn't get immunity from criminal offenses. It's just he has to first be uh, removed from office. As to whether the president could be held civilly liable, that's a much more difficult question because uh, the Supreme Court has held, at least as a matter of federal law, uh, in a case called Nixon against Fitzgerald, that the president cannot be sued in damages for any official acts of his office, that he has what's called absolute immunity from suit. Uh, and so uh, that seems an unlikely route. 
There's also a series of questions about pardons uh, and whether um, President Trump can inoculate himself or any of the other people involved in the riot uh, from future uh, uh, accountability. So the answer to that question is the president certainly could pardon anyone who was involved in the insurrection. Up until he leaves office, he's entitled to issue he's entitled to issue pardons, and there's very little of a limit on that pardon power. That pardon power only applies to federal offenses. It wouldn't apply to an offense that's a violation of the District of Columbia's code, uh, because he's not the person in charge of uh, uh, enforcing that code. Um, the question whether the president can pardon himself is not a question that's ever been answered. There's a lot of debate going on right now about that. Um, I tend to be in some sympathy with the position that Frank Bowman, who's a scholar who's written a lot about pardons has taken, which is if you look at the grammar of the pardon clause, which says granting a pardon, you can't grant something to yourself and therefore uh, the president lacks the power to pardon himself. But we haven't yet seen any president try to do that uh, and therefore we don't have a definitive answer. Okay, thanks. So this Frank, is a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I add just a footnote to what Pam has just said? Please. Um, because the question has come up as implicit, I think, in the first question you addressed to Pam <clears throat> about whether you can conduct an impeachment against somebody who has already left office by one means or another. And as some of us have been recently reminded, at the very moment the framers were discussing that matter in Philadelphia in 1787, they had right to hand a contemporaneous impeachment against one Warren Hastings, who was an officer of the British um, East India Company, who had left office, come back to England, left India, back in the UK or back in England, and he was being impeached at that very moment. So they clearly had in mind the example right in their own time of an impeachment process of somebody who was out of office, and they embraced that, we have every reason to believe, in their definition of who could be impeached and when. Yeah, I mean, they actually did discuss the Hastings impeachment in the uh, Constitutional Convention. So it wasn't just something that was in the news, it was yeah. something they yeah. actually talked about. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about um, Mitch McConnell's uh, strategy or motives in delaying the Senate um, trial uh, now that the House has impeached <laughs> President Trump. So I know that this is not a question that anybody can answer, but I wonder if anybody would willing, be willing to speculate on how the actual Senate trial is going to play out, whether this is going to, you know, are people going to be less angry with the passage of time or more angry? Uh, you know, who does it help relatively when the Republican senators are forced to actually get up and take a position on whether this wasn't an impeachable um, um, uh, uh, event. Uh, so would anyone like to take a shot at that, um, at that question? I can and say that, a word. I think, I think um, McConnell certainly didn't hurry to try to get the Senate back. It was on recess and there, there are these, you know, arguments that it's not so easy to get them back by, unless by unanimous consent, but he certainly didn't he was he was happy to have this be Chuck Schumer's problem as as majority leader. You could argue it'll be a little easier for Republican senators to vote for impeachment when they're not actually removing Trump in real time from the White House, and you don't have the spectacle of him, you know, leaving the three days before he would leave anyway, and with Pence becoming president for three days or something like that. Uh, it, it becomes a, a they will see it a symbolic vote, not without real consequences, as I think. Pam and David might have said, but um, uh, but uh, possibility of disqualifying him from subsequent office. But but still, you could argue it makes the vote a little easier. I'd say the longer time goes by, on the other hand, it seems less urgent and and sort of pointless, people might say, and there'll be a lot of pretending that they would have been for censure if he were still around, but he's not around and we need unity and healing and all this. I guess I'm slightly inclined to think the latter is the more likely way things go and that McConnell would expect, you know, five or eight or 10 votes for it and hopes it happens in a fairly low key way and he can move on without, you know, not content, not having defended Trump and not having uh, spent a lot of political capital and forced his own members to make tough decisions as the House Republicans did. Uh, tough may not be the word, but politically difficult decisions. 
uh, on Trump. So I think that's what was in McConnell's mind. But I, I think it could still go a little bit either way in terms of the dynamics as we discover more about what happened on January 6th. And, and, and for me, it's the, the incitement is terrible, obviously. But the, uh, the real time dereliction of duty by the president, I think, is actually as serious an offense and says, I mean, he is the president. I, I mean, I worked in the White House and you don't have to work in the White House to have this view, I don't think either. I mean, you see something happening in the United States Capitol and you're the president, you're in the Oval Office. I mean, you call, uh, you know, you were in the sit room within 10, situation room within 10 minutes, you're on the phone to the Defense Department and the FBI and DHS, you're making sure that all, you're on the phone to Pelosi and McConnell, you're making sure all resources are there to prevent it from going even further. You yourself, of course, since they're your supporters, are on television within another 20 minutes saying, leave, stop, this is terrible. I mean, that for me is such a flat out, you know, open and shut dereliction of duty in his presidential duties, the other stuff you could slightly say, oh, he was rhetorical and that's the way Trump's been and, you know, whatever. But so I, I think the more we learn about what happened in real time and the degree to which they might have been called off before deaths and, and destruction, you know, happened, might end up hurting him. So I don't know quite what the effect is. The final point I'd make, and I maybe I'm I think I'm right about this, Pam can correct me, is Everyone's treating this, you know, McConnell keeps saying, well, of course, the moment impeachment shows up, we have to work on it 12 hours, you know, the only thing we can work on, and there were all these strict rules. They're not, in the, they're just rules of the Senate. I mean, I think they can be changed. They certainly can be changed. They're just rules of the Senate. I think they can be changed by majority vote even. I don't think it requires a two thirds vote. And so the notion that they can't, you know, confirm Biden's cabinet appointments and even pass the coronavirus legislation, between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and then re reconvene as a court of impeachment at 4 p.m. till 9 p.m. I don't see why they can't. And I think Schumer is inclined to try to do that. Um, I think it was a mistake for some of them to say, oh, we should put this off 100 days. That would be very bad, I think, in terms of not capturing the urgency of the moment and the need for uh, you know, the importance of really having a definitive statement about what, what happened. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Well, I, I have a, a constitutionally naive question for Pam. Can, is it constitutionally illicit for the Senate to refuse to accept or, or to take receipt of the article of impeachment? I don't think they can simply refuse to take the article of impeachment. Um, they can decide what kind of quote unquote trial they want to have. Uh, and that the Supreme Court has held was non-justiciable. Uh, so for example, there was an impeachment of a federal judge because federal judge the, uh, the federal judge was actually convicted of a crime, sent to prison, but he was still drawing his judicial salary because until he gets impeached and removed from office, he's still a federal judge. And the Senate decided to hold his trial by having a committee of senators listen to the evidence and then issue a report to the entire Senate um, so that they didn't stop their business one iota while that impeachment was going on. He challenged that and the Supreme Court said, the Constitution gives the Senate the right to try impeachments and therefore essentially to define what counts as a trial. Well, that's probably not an option in this case, just the optics would be terrible. But... Yeah, although you could imagine holding evidentiary hearings, background hearings, because I think Bill is 100% right that we don't yet know everything. What we now know is the stuff you could see on TV. And that was damning enough because there was essentially, what, a five hour period, a six hour period between when the rioting started and when they managed to get the Capitol back. Uh, and there've been all these reports that the president just wanted to watch TV and was very excited about it. And it wasn't until, what, about four in the afternoon that he came out and gave that hostage-like uh, video <laughs> of, please stop, I love you, but please stop anyway. Um, it, so we may find out a lot more stuff and that may change the dynamics hugely. Uh, and the question whether the whole Senate will sit through a discussion of that or whether they would do that in committee, I suppose, is something they have to decide down the road. Yeah, just on that, I mean, we don't know what calls were made to the White House, whether the Defense Department's apparent slowness, and maybe that's just bureaucracy and life and you don't want the National Guard out there without being sure. Uh, with the 90 day to 90 minute delay that Governor Hogan has talked about in the Maryland National Guard, uh, whether that was because the acting defense secretary and the acting chief of staff there, who are both Trump loyalists that had replaced uh, Esper, who was himself something of a Trump loyalist uh, after November 3rd, um, whether they called over to the White House and someone said, no, we, the president doesn't want you to do this. So there's a lot of evidentiary stuff that would actually be quite 
interesting and important that we could discover. I do think on David's point, I mean, I think I watched it in real time as we all did, but I'm you know, pretty close to it physically. I'm not that close, 10 miles or something, but of course I've been there a million times and it's so stunning to watch. But one was more struck in, in real time by the farcical nature of it and only later by the really dangerous nature of it, partly because people got killed, but also just the degree to which it wasn't just a bunch of clowns and weird outfits, you know, sitting in the speaker's uh, a chair at her desk, that's bad enough, but that there were these paramilitary little nuggets buried into the, so to speak, the broader mob uh, action. And I, I think, again, the more we learn about that, uh, not that the president would have personally known about that, I suppose, but uh, it does raise other questions though, about members of Congress's knowledge and, and sort of this, how seriously to take it. You know, the, the Marx line, I, I learned this from, uh, it was a piece in The Atlantic, wasn't it, by uh, Zainab Tufeki, uh, that pointed out that, so Marx's famous line is, Hegel said somewhere, says somewhere, history repeats itself. He, what he didn't say is it's first time tragedy, second time farce. Now what Marx says that in 18, writes that in 1852 about, uh, uh, what's his name, Napoleon II, Louis, Louis, uh, Louis Napoleon, right? And his sort of coup that did end, the French uh, Republic sort of, and, um, the first, the first time was the serious, you know, uh, for the first Napoleon in 1795 or whatever. But as, as she points out in the Atlantic, it actually led to the end of French demo democracy for 18 years and, 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 and all kinds of other bad consequences in France. It wasn't, the farce wasn't without consequence, I guess. And so things can be farcical and damaging at the same time. And I, I do think in terms of the public perception, my sense is everyone was more struck by the farcical side of it in, on January 6th itself and now as it's sinking in and there's more reporting, more struck by the really dangerous side of it. But Bill, the difference is and that was a successful farce. Louis Napoleon yes. did take power. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so there's a whole bunch of questions about <clears throat> social media and the platforms and uh, in particular about Twitter's decision to deplatform uh, the president. Um, so I wonder if anyone has any, um, you know, reactions to the role that these companies, these big companies are playing um, in American politics at the present moment and what we ought to be thinking about in, in the long term. Well, I would just say that um, it's not political if you start with clear rules and principles and then, you know, neutrally and by some kind of procedure and rationale uh, enforce those principles. And, you know, if you look at the codes of these social media companies, I would say uh, Twitter and Facebook, for example, um, I don't think it was political. I think you could argue that they should have acted sooner, but that the incitement to violence that we have seen and witnessed and heard with our own eyes, uh, you know, was completely disqualifying in my view. I would be interested to have Pam say a word if she can and willing to, since she's on um, the, well, you can say the exact name of it, Pam, but the Facebook content moderation review panel, you know, how she's viewing this challenge in the wake of that formally constituted uh, body and its responsibility. So I can't in part because I'm on, I'm on leave from Oh. Uh, Facebook oversight board uh, and have been since slightly before the election. Um, you know, and and I wouldn't be entitled to comment on behalf of the board, even if even if I had. What do you think about the it. concept of the body and its work? Well, I, th you know, the, the body had just stood up in the fall, so we haven't yet had the first round of decisions coming from it. Um, it you know, it's an experiment to see whether a board like this can do what it's supposed to, it's supposed to do. Um, and I think it's gonna be a couple of years before we know whether it actually works. I would say, yeah, Frank, um, you talk, Frank, you should talk about this. Since yeah, you know, well, you know a lot I, about, I have I thought say, about this a little bit. I would say, say, you know, about the Twitter decision, uh, a couple of things, first of all, uh, I'm glad it happened because you're facing an emergency that's a danger, you know, it's a danger to the Republic. And if you don't act, there's going to be further incitement. And so the actual decision I was, you know, very supportive of. But uh, it does seem to me that 
it also demonstrated how powerful Twitter is because, you know, we haven't heard from the president ever since they made, made that decision and they've taken away, you know, his major uh, bullhorn. And it does seem to me, and, and so this is why I don't like the idea of the platforms themselves doing content moderation. I think that that is a, that's a short uh, term stopgap kind of measure that in a national emergency is acceptable, but it is not a long-term solution uh, because, and this is where scale matters. I mean, this is what we've been thinking about in this little Stanford working group on platform scale that, um, you know, if you're, if you're in a competitive media market, you can act as a media company like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and moderate the content that's on your platform. If you are as large as Twitter or Facebook or Google, you're more like one of the networks back in the 1950s and 60s, where you really have a major ability to shape the information and the way that people think about things. And so even though the First Amendment protects the right of these private companies uh, to moderate content and, and you know, publish what they want, they are de facto playing a, a quasi-public role as the main channel of political communication. And I just don't think that that's legitimate uh, in a democracy. Now we've suggested, our, our group has suggested a solution to this, which is basically to create uh, a layer of what we call uh, middleware companies that would ride on top of the platforms and allow um, uh, the outsourcing of that content moderation function to uh, other companies that could suit the, you know, the preferences of individual users, which would take that power away from, you know, these giant companies. But I don't think that we've adequately confronted the fact that we allowed them to get, you know, as big and powerful uh, as they, um, uh, as they become. But I don't know. Can I just add one word? I mean, I think, I also think, don't you think the debate about this has been so cartoonish and silly on all sides so that there's sort of a, they're private companies, they can do whatever they want, or they're omnipotent and they need to be 100% regulated, or they're, you know, they shouldn't be able to, I mean, it's it's so, uh, they it doesn't do any harm, it's just what people think. I mean, and so we had, I kind of very much agree with you on Twitter's decision. I also have talked to someone in counterterrorism yesterday who said he thought it was the right thing, it was an urgent emergency, but honestly, no one has taken a real close look and then Facebook shut down a whole bunch of other things, including genuine conspirators and, you know, really bad actors. But no one had really thought through in the way you would if you were like having a normal grown up public policy law enforcement process. The shutting them down from the Facebook drive them into the more obscure and more uh, encrypted sites, which makes them more dangerous. I think Merkel made this comment that she was worried about that in Germany. I mean, so these are really tough po policy choices. This is why we have a representative democracy with, ex you know, with legislators and bureaucrats and experts and law professors and everyone who contribute to the debate. But I, I would say that the discussion has been so. Uh, we, I mean, in the last four years, it's been impossible to have a serious discussion about anything in a way. But we need to have a actual real discussion about a bunch of possible public policies to deal with this and because it's been I mean, as someone who doesn't know much about it i'd say i feel like only recently have i begun to be aware of sort of even how to think about this this problem All right okay we only have another five minutes so uh i want to move on to some other questions i guess this is one more for larry uh there's some questions about how other populists around the world, like Jair Bolsonaro in uh, Brazil or Viktor Orban in Hungary, are going to react to this? Do they see? Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the authoritarians are reveling, as you've indicated in this. But in terms of their calculations about, you know, do I double down on on my populism in my country? Uh, how does this affect their thinking? So. Uh... You know, I'm really glad you asked that question, Frank. I saw it in the ch in the box, and I would recommend that everyone read uh, the article in the Atlantic today by two of the leaders of the excellent organization Protect Democracy, Grant Tudor and Ian Basson, which is a I think compelling appeal for prosecuting Donald Trump, uh, obviously under the law to the extent possible, and for legal accountability more generally. Uh, and 
their point is that, you know, if you look at all the history of state prosecutions of governors for corruption and abuse of power, you see that it's very important in, um, you know, setting standards and expectations and entrenching norms. Norms are not self-enforcing. They have to ultimately be enforced through the law by the courts and by the realization that there are consequences for people's action. And um, uh, I think this is true internationally as well, uh, that authoritarian power grabbers around the world, and we know that Bolsonaro uh, and uh, many of the others, uh, President Duterte in the Philippines and so on, who are admirers of President Trump has have been fo closely following news about him. And if they see that the consequence of this is going to lead not only to uh, his electoral defeat, but to his disgrace and potentially prosecution, I think it could have a sobering effect on the uh, potential for some of these elected uh, autocracy uh, aspiring individuals to go further down the road than they already have. Uh, we have a question from one of our former Draper Hills fellows, Natalia Gumenyuk from uh, Ukraine. Uh, and she's wondering about what uh, happens now that the Republican Party seems to have lost control of its base. There are many law enforcement officers that seem to be participating in this. Are they going to be able to get control of you know, this kind of situation? Um, and, you know, you're, you're not going to get rid of craziness in the Republican Party, but at least, you know, this kind of extremism, is that something that you're hopeful can be uh, uh, put under control? I mean, I would just say the statement by the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and all the chiefs actually the other day was really remarkable. And I talked to a couple of people pretty close to them and, you know, in the defense establishment who said they are alarmed. They're alarmed by what might have been going on in the ranks that they haven't been paying much attention to. Uh, I think that statement by the 10 former secretaries of defense uh, was uh, I, welcomed, I know, by the existing service chiefs. So I think the degree to, and the police forces do seem to be even, frankly, more of a problem. And again, it's it's a huge country and these are huge institutions and there are free speech rights and people have, you know, one doesn't want to go too far the other way in a, in a sense and or, or panic about it. But I, I think the degree to which we have a broader, this in a way gets to the the point uh, uh, David made too, that I mean, the, the, uh, the degree to which we have a broader problem than just a our political institutions are a little messed up or we had one really bad leader, but we have a broader social and cultural problem uh, with the appeal of various forms of authoritarianism and demagoguery is really, is there. Uh, okay, so we need to conclude. Does anyone wanna say something more optimistic? We've had a lot of pessimism expressed about the current situation and what the January 6th says about that. Uh, there's many questions in the chat uh, or in the Q&A about what we, you know, what the hell we do about this going forward. Um, you know, so that's obviously not an easy question to answer, but I wonder if anyone has any closing thoughts on, you know, how a Biden administration or civil society or any of the other actors in American society that really want to defend, you know, our democratic traditions, what do we do and what can we hope for, you know, going forward that might reverse some of these trends? Maybe I could I just say one word. I mean, on November 3rd, we had a mass, a huge turnout election that seems to have been conducted incredibly well uh, in a pandemic, which people were not prepared for by a ton, hundreds of thousands of citizens, many of whom were not professionals who volunteer with a lot of civil society participation by philanthropies and, uh, and others helping out when Congress didn't appropriate the funds they should. So that was a sign, I would say November 3rd was a sign of the health of America, if you want to put it that way. What happens has happened subsequently is more, much more problematic. And we will have a transition on January 20th. And um, so, we, you know, that maybe that puts it a little bit in perspective. Yeah, and I'd add January 4th was another smaller, but also positive sign in Georgia. Okay, well, <laughs> but that's what we to hope. Uh, we will go forward. I really want to thank all of the panelists. It was a really great discussion. Uh, I think um, uh, 
reaching the stature of the seriousness of the events that we've uh, uh, we've experienced. So thank you all for participating. Thanks to all of you in the audience. And I noticed that there were more than a thousand people on this uh, on this webinar. So thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, and as Mike said, you know, tune in again because we're going to continue this series at FSI at Stanford. So uh, good afternoon, and and we'll see you later.